hand washing. As long as you wash your hands before and after each patient. Oh, uh, where is my uh, hand sanitizer? Adriana, let's pass this hand sanitizer up here. All of you, maybe at one point in time, thank you so much, have been in the healthcare field and you're waiting to have your blood drawn or you're waiting for the physician to come in and you see them do this. They walk into the room, or they've just seen another patient and they do this. Okay, this is green. Let's, uh, let me feel your glands. I'm just gonna see, you know, you have a sore throat. Like, okay, that's not hand washing. That's not a substitute for hand washing. When I take my mom in to get her blood drawn, I don't see the phlebotomist wash her hands. She goes and she does this, and she does this, and it's like, and, and it, not even like this, but more like this. It's like, okay, and that's supposed to make me feel better how? And do, do I, and do I stop her and say, will you please go wash your hands? No, because she's going to give me the evil eye. Yeah, they, <laughs> they scare me. The some of the phlebotomists <laughs> scare me because I'm afraid that they're, they're going to give me the evil eye. Yeah, yeah. Dare you ask me to go wash my hands? I'm afraid. The doctor walks in, and it's like you can hear the, the, the sharp music from Jaws. Do, 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 do. And he's coming at me with his hands. I was like, no. How many people have you already touched before you've come into this room? But if you're trained in that to begin with, it should become second nature. It should be fabulous. Yeah, but, I mean, if somebody questions you about it, you shouldn't get upset. Of course not. But you know that, and I know that. But how many times have you been in a situation where it's like you're just afraid to even, like, tap them on the shoulder or just ask them a question? It's like... And we shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't be that way. We should be able, if somebody, even if you washed your hands, and a patient says to you, could you please wash your hands before you draw blood on me? Do you answer, A, well, I just washed my hands before I came in this room. Or B, of course, it would be my pleasure. B and B. B. Really is telling them with your hands on your hips going to make them feel better that you told them you washed your hands already? No, it's just going to make them afraid. If you're going for the fear factor, then it would be A. I've been doing this for 10 years. Thank you. Yeah. I know what I'm doing. Or if they see you take a needle and you inspect it to be sure the seal's not broken and you break the seal, the patient's watching and says, you know, could you use another needle? I think that seal was broken. Do you A, say, oh, no, that seal wasn't broken. I just broke it. There was no break. This would be fine. Or B, absolutely. Let's get another one. Mm -hmm. B. B. It's more therapeutic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. A just makes you look like, you know, somebody that doesn't like their field. <laughs> I used to keep it in my pocket because I ran into nurses all the time who really shouldn't have been in the nursing field. Nurses, A, like how in the world did you get into this field? How did that even happen? You know, they've got the superiority complex. They've got the authority complex. They've got, you know, and uh, so I was driving down, um, it was in Taylor. I forget what road it was on. It's called Burt's Trucking. I ran and got some coupon flyers. And uh, when I would see a nurse be rude with a patient, where I'd see, you know, a nurse's aide, you know, not treat people like they should. We have mailboxes. I would slip the Burt's trucking coupon into their mailbox. Like, Kent, 50%, you know, $100 off, three-week trucking, get your CDL license. <laughs> you know, they belonged behind a rig, so whatever they dish out, they can get back from the other truckers, right? <laughs> Because patients aren't going to dish it out because they feel vulnerable and helpless. So I'm Nancy, there was two other things uh, I noticed when I was shadowing. We, the girls would always use the same tourniquet for quite a while. What do you they think just, about they, that? I don't like it because Why? You know, you're, it's close to the blood draw. 
and they wouldn't wipe the seat down every time, you know. So you have a blood draw on the arm, on the arm of the chair, excuse me. And I, I, now you have me reflecting back. Now yes. what's, what's missing? Reflect. Yeah. You should have a new tourniquet for every yeah. patient. And she had a whole box of them. Sure, she could use But it. she would just put it on the arm of the chair until the next one came in. And the arm of the chair, yeah. yeah. Tourniquets, which you're going to get today, because we're going to do tourniquet time today. I got some tourniquets in there. I have to get them from the front desk. But um, you're going to get tourniquets. The tourniquets, imagine, I like to use this example. Somebody comes in with shingles. It's a, it's a form of chicken pox, right? They're sores, they weep. You don't even know. They've got it right here. You're not even going to look behind their arm. Right? And they just broke. So now the next person who comes in is an end stage AIDS patient who has no immunity whatsoever. You basically, by putting this tourniquet on them, just kill them because they're not going to be able to fight uh, the, the varicella um, shingles virus. Okay. And actually, that happened. A similar happened. I had shingles last year. Um, I had to go in for uh, uh, colonoscopy. Okay. I started noticing these blisters started oh, yeah. appearing on the inside of my leg, and I had no idea what they were. So I went in for the colonoscopy the next day, and a nurse came up, and she was getting me ready and everything, and I said, oh, and by the way, I need the doctor to look here and tell me what these are. She was pregnant. And the doctor came, and he looked at it and said, you need, you're not even supposed to be around here. And so we had to postpone it another week or so because of that, because the shingles had cleared up so bad. And it's contagious. And very it's contagious. Really onset. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's very contagious. And so the blisters break. Right. Yeah. Oh, God. and they dry up. Oh, it's yeah. very contagious. Very painful, too. Oh, it was horrible. But point B, these are a source of infection. Okay, now here, because you're only going to use like one or two people, you can use one. I suggest these are a dollar a piece. If you need to buy a lot of them, you can, okay? But typically our students draw on one or two people, always the same people. But you want to take care of these. So I put, want to tell you to have them in a paper plastic bag, keep it sealed, because if they start to get nasty looking, you need to get another one, okay? You don't want to use these. But in a hospital, when you're going from room to room to room, chuck them. Outpatient lab, throw them away. I had a phlebotomy teacher that taught with us for a while. Do you know, she told me that they used to reuse the hubs. They would bleach them, they would clean them, and they would reuse them. The hubs. Why the reluctance? It was a hospital. Oh. Why the reluctance to throw them away? Oh, I don't know. I, I throw everything away. Um, I teach you guys that even if you set up at a table, and let's say you're not ready, you don't feel comfortable with the draw, but you haven't used the equipment, I have you throw it away. Because this way, you'll always know that you're developing the habit. If you don't use it, you throw it away. If you've prepared it as if you were going to use it because the intention was there to use it, you throw it away because that way you'll never run the risk of saying, did I open this needle or not? Right? So I don't care how much you waste. I'm going to show you how, how much paper I waste when I wash my hands, too. When people used to come in from ER with their IVs, or I, I have a patient with an IV bag, and I couldn't see the date on it, or the initials, or I might see the initials of the person who started it, but no date. Usually what I do is I get rid of the tubing, and I change the bag, and I change the IV because I don't know how long that IV's been in there. And the longer that something's in you, right, the greater the source of infection, right? So my advice to all of you is when in doubt, throw it out. If you've prepared a vacutainer needle and hub to do a blood draw and somebody says, may I keep that butterfly? And you 
didn't say sure. Throw that one out. Don't use, don't save it and say, well, I haven't used it. I'll leave it for the next person. Throw it out. You had the intention of using it. Therefore, it is used. That's the way I want you to think. That way you're not going to slip up and, and, and try to use something that's been used to give somebody septicemia, which is blood poison. Okay. All right, we're going to talk about infection. I love the hand washing. You guys are right on top of everything. Hand washing. Always. There's a way to wash your hands. And I'm going to show you, and I know that sounds silly. Nancy's going to show us how to wash our hands. Uh, Dave, I'm going to be over here by the sink washing my hands. I will, you can stop, pause, whatever. Okay, so I want you to watch this. Um, so let's say this is the patient's sink or even if it's the sink behind the nursing desk. Don't trust that everybody's going to have the same hygienic traits that you have. How they touch the faucet handles are very dirty. Even though you're going to wash your hands, I say don't touch the faucet handles. So I'm going to grab some paper towel. Thank you so much for your hand. I'm going to go ahead and turn the faucet on first using paper towels. The, the, the housekeepers at the hospital, they don't like me too much because they're always followed, always where I go, paper towel usually ends up gone. You know, they're having to replace it. Try to get warm water, not too hot. Hot water can hurt your hands, right? Nice warm water. Of course, you won't find hot water in a hospital anyway. You have to let it run forever just to get warm. So you most of the time you're washing your hands in cold water. So now you're going to rinse your hands. And now I'm going to get some soap, so I'm going to grab another piece of paper towel. Thank you, thank you. Let's dispense some soap. Now you're going to work up a lather. Now this is a medical aseptic technique. Surgical hand washing is 20 minutes. They use a, an iodine-based soap. They wash up to their elbows. This is just basic medical hand washing. You want to ha keep your nails short. Right? You want to scrub between your fingers. You want to scrub the palms of your hand where MRSA grows. You know, keep your nails clean. Just go up to your up to your wrists. That's it. And then work up a nice lather. And now we're going to rinse. Now, I'm not going to rinse from my wrists to my fingers. Why? Because I don't know where that demarcation line is exactly between the soap and non-soap. Right? So if I start water from here. Whatever area I didn't wash is just the germs are going down to my fingers, right? So I'm going to go from my fingers to my wrists. Because at least that way, I know that I've washed my hands. I think they do it a little differently for Cena, but they're always switching up. Okay. Okay, at this point, I want you all to resist the urge to flick. We have flickers here, okay? Everybody's, th there's always a flicker in one of our classes. What does that mean, flicking? Let's just, it feels so good to lick it. No, don't. Okay, I'm going to grab some more paper towel. I'm going to dry since I went from my wrist to my fingertips to rinse. I mean, to, to I went from my fingertips to my, my wrist to rinse. I'm going to dry. Fingertips, palms, wrist, throw away. Thank you. Fingertips, palms wrist, throw away, last one, my hands are dry, I'm going to use dry paper towel to shut off the water, thank you Abraham, I'm good, and then I'm going to use my paper towel to dispense hand sanitizer, why hand sanitizer, what does hand sanitizer do, it kills fungi and spores, so that means soap and water doesn't kill fungi and spores? How weird is that? You think soap and water killed everything? It doesn't. It's a lubricant. It's a, just to loosen yeah. things. Loosen things up. Yeah, well, I like, good job definitions back there, John. Steve, good. Yeah. But this hand sanitizer kills fungi and spores. Now my hands feel really clean. Now I'm ready to do a venipuncture on my patient or assess my patient. And I'll put gloves on, on top of that. But hand washing will prevent the spread of, of disease. Truly it will. 
And it's a very important concept that I want all of you to, to, to do in class. So even when we're practicing, I'm going to say, go wash your hands. We're doing tourniquet time. Go wash your hands. Right now, I'm going to have everybody get up and duplicate my method. So what I'd like you to do is I've got some paper towel here, so one of you be the, the paper towel person, okay? Because the paper towel that we have up here, which I'm out of right now, the dispenser that where you hit it like this, you don't really want to touch anything. So most of the paper towel at the hospital is what? It comes, the, the paper towel just kind of pull it out, right? And usually I pull it out in chunks. It never comes out as one or two or three. You know, it just comes out like, like, like a three inches thick. But the, po the point here is you always want to wash your hands. So if I've washed my hands and I've got a door to get out, do I have to touch the door now? What am I going to use? Paper towel. Paper towel. Now you're getting it. Right? So what I'd like all of you to do right now is I'm going to have Ibrahim watch each of you come to the sinks and wash your hands. Okay? Or we can just line up with one sink. Because I think I have just soap right here. So uh, each of you take turns holding the paper towel for your partner. And we're going to wash our hands. Okay, you guys don't mind being on camera for this? Shall we, do you want us to stop running or are you okay? Are you guys okay with it? Yeah. I'm going to get my good side. <laughs> so, cold paper towels, I'll get you some. Don't worry about how much paper towel you use. I don't care. I don't care how many rolls you want to go through. Just do it right. <laughs> you guys are such a good sport to be on camera. So, so the, the, the hand washing, when you dry your hands, it's very deliberate, isn't it? You notice how I use paper towel for different parts of my hand? I didn't use the same paper towel. I didn't do this with paper towel. What am I doing if I do this with paper towel? Rubbing it back and forth. I'm just moving the germs, right? Very good. Yay! Thank you. Are you looking for a hand sanitizer? Here you go. There you be. Now, when you guys go home this week and you practice this, you'll never, you, you'll always, you'll always do hand washing this way because your hand will feel so clean. And I've got some for everybody. Backwards. Yeah, Backwards. 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 She got a better ladder than I did. Yeah, how can I use enough soap? Yeah. I actually think you'd, you'd be fine, you know, just to uh, dispense the stuff normally. Because after you clean it, you Yeah, because yeah. I'm using a paper towel every time, right? Yeah, I'm <laughs> <laughs> so, so bad. It's more, it's more economical. Uh -huh. <laughs> you were thinking economical. 
And plus, I'm used to the, you know, the air ones. <laughs> the ones where you push the button and the air. The air oh, dry. Abraham, oh, how did I do? Yeah, how did I do? Yeah, you're I just, okay. I just uh, hand sanitizer. Yep. So we need that type of sanitizer, Joe? We need that type of Fungi and what? <laughs> Let's try it over again. All right. Fungi and what? Fungi and spores. 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 S-P-O-R-E-S. Spores. Spores.
great at that. Yeah. You're going to be great at drawing blood by like washing your hands. Switches. Oh. Old habits. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. It's yeah. funny when you're being looked at. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Avery. You guys are great. Did she say that? that that's where Abraham I Abraham said that. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. he said because you're going to wind up yeah. um, duplicating that effort anyway.
because of HIPAA rules. We can't ask people, well, do you have AIDS? Do you have Hep C? Do you have any blood-borne diseases? It's against the law to ask that question. So you might be drawing on Hep C people all day long if you don't even know it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, blood is one of the most contagious tissue, tissue it's a fluid. Blood is a, is a tissue, and, and it's one of the most contagious substances known to man. So you're, you're working with people, you're working with blood, maybe you're one of those people that don't wash your hands that often. You go home and you make meatloaf with the ring and the nails, and it's like, okay. Doesn't sound, also rings can cut people's skin. Rings can also cut people's skin, right? Like if I'm changing a patient and I put my gloves on, that ring's gonna go what? Right through the glove, right? My nails, right through the glove if I have nails. Also, if I'm tucking a, a chuck or I'm putting a brief on somebody or I'm changing a bed and I put my hands underneath, I could cut their skin. So a healthcare field is not, a, when you go to work, you really want to be keep it simple. You know, no heavy perfume. What's wrong with the perfume thing or cologne? Why? Allergic? It makes them nauseous if they're sick already, right? You ever have, get into a room or a city or in the car with someone and you can taste their cologne? Yeah. Is that good? Um, you know, we want to keep our hair pulled back off of our necks. We want to keep our, our, what's wrong with the big hoop? Long earrings, long jewelry. When you're leaning into the area, if that goes into the sterile field, you've ruined everything, haven't you? Also, if you're dealing with a patient that might have Alzheimer's, they're going to go for that, that earring, right? You're going to be like this. you got your needle like this. It's like you don't want to be in that situation. So let's take a look at our quiz for next week. Number one, what is a nosocomial infection? How would we answer that question? Very good, Adriana. So a, a nosocomial infection is what? A hospital-acquired infection. That's the answer to number one. A hospital-acquired infection. And what were some of the examples that I gave about hospital-acquired infections? MRSA. MRSA. What else? Urinary tract infections due to Foley catheters and dwelling catheters. Ventilator-associated pneumonia. So there's, there's many. Can healthcare providers, can we get nosocomial infections? Sure, sure. If anyone's been in the healthcare field long enough, they'll know that you've taken a bug home, one or two bugs, and your family's never forgiven you for that. <laughs> I took C. diff home once, Clostridium difficile. The man wasn't in isolation. And I gowned, I gloved, I didn't mask. I was cleaning up vomit and diarrhea. And he wasn't in isolation, but I just wanted to cover my uniform and use gloves. Should have used a mask. The next day, my whole family had C. diff as well as me. Mm. They will never forget it till this day. And they told me if I ever, if they even think that I'm going to bring something home, they're going to pitch in and get me a hotel on Michigan Avenue somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's worse. <laughs> and not a very nice play, part of Detroit <laughs> if I do that again. Yeah. So yeah, you really <laughs> don't want, you want to take precautions. Okay, you really want to take precautions. I was changing a dressing on this one lady, and I noticed that the dressing didn't look, her wound, it just didn't look right. It wasn't, uh, there was no serosanguinous drainage, which is blood and water, and tissue fluid, which is a good, healthy drainage. It shows the capillaries are breaking, healing, just nothing. It was like dead skin, it just kind of flapped into the wound. I said, oh, something doesn't look right with this. And I was doing a dressing change for one of the other nurses that asked me to help out. And, I, and it was the, the she had a, uh, a cyst that was actually removed and drained. And they cultured it, and I went and checked her labs on the computer. It turned out to be oxicillin-resistant staphylococcus aureus, which is even worse than MRSA, the methicillin-resistant. I said, oh, great, Scott. So I called the supervisor. We got an isolation cart put in front of her room. Yes, I powwowed with all the nurses aides and told them don't go in this room unless you're gown, glove, mask. That night that I went home, I had my family throw my clothes in the garage. I went to the garage, I changed. I bathed in Hibiclens for three days straight, which is uh, chlorhexidine, you can get it at the pharmacy. 
and I threw all my clothes away, and I just bought my uniform, but I wasn't going to attempt to wash it. Yeah, it was, it was really bad. So you have to be aware that you're going to run across very contagious you know, diseases when you're in the hospital. Okay, let's do number two. How many vaccinations are needed for a hepatitis B series? Three. Three. Now, you know that is voluntary, right? Most right. hospitals make that voluntary. You don't have to get the vaccination. There are three vaccinations over a period of six months, and it's usually good for 10 years. Number three, what is MRSA? How would you define MRSA? Flesh-eating disease. Flesh-eating disease, okay? If you wanted to spell this out, methicillin, Resistant aureus, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, just a flesh eating disease. It's a staph infection, and it is a uh, opportunistic uh, bacteria, in a such that people with very low immunity, post-op, surgical patients, uh, especially those patients that have had some type of abdominal surgery or dirty surgeries, um, can get it. People with open wounds can get it. We carry staph on us. It lives on the palms of our hand and in the nares of your nose. And if there's an outbreak of MRSA, infection control will come up and ask you to do a nasal swab. They're actually going to come up to you and swab your nose, which is very offensive, if you ask me. Um, but usually that's a sign that there's an outbreak. Uh, now we give uh, post-op, right before surgery, we usually give uh, rocephin, vancomycin, or gentamicin, 250 mLs prior to surgery to prevent any post-op surgical side infection. But it's, it's from a low, your immune system, or yes. a low immune, and from uh, back, uh, airborne, uh, is it airborne or blood? To it's receive contact. Contact, okay. Yes, it's also, it's, it's very opportunistic because if you have low immunity and you've just had surgery and any type of, any type of, of uh, invasive procedure will affect one's immunity, um, just touching the area can cause that to grow. Okay. So that's why hand washing for all of us is so important. Okay, let's do number four. What is the best way of preventing infection in a healthcare setting? There you go. Uh, number five, how does surgical hand washing differ from medical hand washing? Well, different, 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 different. different soap, time, time, good, I like it. How about area? All the way up to the elbows. Up to the okay. elbows, very good. Okay, code of ethics. How Can you remember one of the code of ethics that I wrote on the board? Privacy. Protection and defense of person's comfort, safety. safety. Good, I like it. Dignity. Beautiful. Code of ethics. How can we, here, number seven, give an example of owning a patient's problem. That always seems to throw students. When you work in any type of hospital or healthcare environment, we're all, we're a team, right? We all work as a team. Certainly if you're not a nurse's aide, you can't take someone off the bed. You can't get someone up or ambulate them to the bathroom without knowing what their doctor's order is. But if somebody has their call light on, you can answer it, right? Mm -hmm. And you can tell them, I'll go get the person to help you. Someone calls for pain medication. You may not be able to give them pain medication, but you can go tell the nurse, right? Mm -hmm. And then come back and tell the patient that you've told the nurse. Because if you don't go back and tell the patient you've told the nurse, what's the patient going to think you did? Mm -hmm. You didn't dropped the ball, you. right? Mm -hmm. You didn't care. You didn't tell anybody. So if somebody asks for a blanket, if somebody asks for, uh, oh, could you please turn the light on or shut the door, or can you please get someone to get me off the bedpan, you can own that problem because they dropped it in your lap. But solve it within the scope of your practice until you pass it off to somebody that can do that, right? So certainly if someone's on the bedpan, you're not going to draw their blood. They're going to say, you know, my nurse aide put me on the bedpan. My behind is sore, I'd like to get off of this. Say, you know what, let me go get your nurse's aid and let her know. 
forget the call button. Yeah. Call for and press the call button. Yeah. So get, seek out and get someone for them. You know what really used to irk me is that I'd be working on the floor, phlebotomists would be up and down the halls, and I don't expect phlebotomists to answer our call lights, obviously. But if you've got somebody calling for help from one of the rooms, and I see somebody, one of the phlebotomist or other, walk by that room, I'm going to be a little bit upset that you didn't stop and at least ask, can I get somebody for you, okay? Because you're a phlebotomist does not give you any type of rights that you're not allowed to talk or answer call lights or help out. If there's a code, and there's a code, we're calling a code blue, and I'm in a room, and this has actually happened to me. I, 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 I was looking for a, uh, the Dynamat machines to do my morning vitals. And I was walking up and down the halls because if you don't grab those machines right away to get your patient's vital signs, you're going to have to wait until the nurses, other nurses are done with them. So I went down to the other hall. I was walking past this patient's room, and this one lady looked like she was uh, in distress. So I went in there, and she went into a cardiac arrest. She was on a big boy bed. There was no ambu bag above the bed. There was no head bedboard. The call light was like way over there because her bed was over here and I knew I needed to start doing chest compressions. So here I am doing chest compressions going code blue, code blue, and the nurse, I figured somebody was going to hear me because it was like 7.15 in the morning, so one of the midnight nurses is walking past the room, looks right at me, I, she makes eye contact with me and keeps going. So I increased my vocal, uh, my voice a little bit, and I shouted cold blue. Then everybody started coming. You don't, if somebody needs help, you have to realize if you're part, if the hospital has hired you, you're one of the health care providers, you need to participate in whatever you're called on. Um, about the nurse, you know,
it's against the law for you to even check on your own blood work. If you were in the ER that night and you came to work the next day, you can't go and look for your blood work. Let's say your ex-boyfriend comes in, okay, with his girlfriend. And she popped him in the eye, you know, and he deserted you at prom or whatever. And you you want to find out what's going on. Don't look on the computer. Go downstairs. Take a break. Go see him. Are you really there to make sure he's okay? No. You just want to see the shiner. Okay? <laughs> But the point of it is, you have a, you're going to be given and trusted with a login username and access code. Use it wisely. Curiosity killed the cat. And people have the, we want to protect everybody's information. It's just like if you know, let's say your mom knows that her neighbor that she plays Jingo with is on your floor. Well, Nancy, uh, you know, Mary is on your floor. Can you tell me why she's in the hospital? Well, no, Mom, I can't. Oh, no, this isn't happening. I had you, I brought you into this world, I'll take you out, you sit down and you tell me everything. Oh, Mom, I can't do it. I, I can't tell you. I can't even acknowledge that Mary's on our floor. That's not going to go over well with Mom, right? So you have to realize that whatever you say about a patient using their name, you have, you have broached their security, their privacy. You have completely devastated and gone against your code of ethics as a healthcare provider. And it will come back. It will come back to you, one way or another. If your mom's standing in line with Mary and she says, well, I, how are you doing since you had gallbladder surgery? I never told anybody. Well, I've heard doctors talk amongst themselves about patients in the elevator. Of course. Yeah. Bad place, right? right? I know. And you know what? Downstairs in the cafeteria, really bad place to decompress, okay? Because you don't know who's around you. You could have people's families sitting right behind you. When I used to go downstairs to the cafeteria with my other, my fellow nurses, we would sit and we'd want to talk so bad about our day. And we just have to sit there and eat and just look at each other and not say a word because you don't know whose family members are sitting behind you. You know, so we'd have to go back upstairs, go into the patient's lounge, and then decompress. Okay, you're going to need to talk to people, your supervisors, um, your peers, in confidence regarding certain patients and certain uh, incidences that happen throughout the day. That's just the normal part of, of being in healthcare. But be, be cognizant of who you share the information with, okay? Not in the middle of the hall. You know, if I have to call help, like we need lifting help in a room, I'll put the call light on and say, can I get some lifting help in room 506? Well, you know, now that you brought it to mind, now it makes more sense because I remember old Henry Ford Hospital, Maine. Everybody used to co-mingle down in the cafeteria. And all of a sudden, you notice over the years, then there became more options for the general public and other people to eat outside of there, like the Little Caesars and sure. other places. And now it makes sense that one of the reasons probably is because they wanted to lessen the commingling in the employee cafeteria amongst the employees and the family members. That makes sense, and that, that's probably why they did that. Um, so please be cognizant, okay? Uh, why are HIPAA laws important? List four types of the hepatitis virus. How many types of hepatitis do we have? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I think it's up to G. Yeah, it's crazy. It keeps mutating. Yeah. What is hepatitis? What does that mean, hepatitis? Itis, medical terminology. Inflammation. Yeah, good job. Inflammation of what organ? Kidney. Well, liver? No. Hepatitis. Um, no, um, liver. The liver. liver. Okay, what is the purpose of universal precautions? I'm going to write down this, and I want you to commit it to memory, what universal precautions means, because it's really going to follow you throughout your health career. Universal precautions. It means to 
treat all blood and body fluids. Oh, I hear somebody, they know this. Body fluids as what? Potentially what? Hazardous. Yes. Hazardous. All blood and body fluids. Whether you're drawing on a five-year-old or a 50-year-old. Blood is dangerous. It's hazardous. Body fluid. Okay? How is hepatitis spread? Blood and body fluids, right? Is there any different way of contracting? Because I know A, I mean, is there any different way that one is seen mostly from the other? About the hepatitis viruses? Yeah. Okay, typically B, okay. you're going to get it through urine, stool, or feces, or needle sticks. Okay. Uh, same with C, urine, stool, feces, needle sticks. Um, but... Uh, a is for food. It's ingested. So let's say you get some strawberries from Mexico. They, they fertilize in Mexico a lot of the fertilizer with human feces and animal dung. Okay, E. coli, big. So if there's any hepatitis in that, that can live on, you know, and, and be brought over to the United States, uh, typically water. Uh, you can get it, uh, but hepatitis A, you'll go through the same process, symptoms, infection, the whole nine yards as hepatitis B or C. You'll get the malaise, the fatigue, the body ache, the neuralgia, the low-grade fever, the sweats. Uh, and then about two to three weeks later, the inflammation will set in. You'll become jaundice. The sclera of your eyes will turn yellow. It's, it's, it's really amazing. They turn yellow. Mm -hmm. You know, and the skin has a yellowish hue. And then that will subside. And then hepatitis A, you'll actually heal from. The ingesting of food, botulism? I mean, is that what you're talking about? Binary, yes, the okay, ingestion. Okay. It gets okay. to you through ingestion. Okay. Um, and then uh, hepatitis, then, but you'll get better. Hepatitis B, not so much. You maybe 50-50 chance of getting better. You know, um, you know, some people's bodies can fight it off. Some people can't. Sometimes long term, the result of long term hepatitis is liver cancer. Um, hepatitis C, not too much. It's not good. I mean, they do treat with immunoglobulin therapy. They almost treat hepatitis the same way they treat AIDS. But you can't give blood anymore. Your blood is infectious, right? So you really don't want to be around needles. You don't want to be around things that could harm somebody if, you're, if you get poked and that blood gets into somebody else's womb. Um, I actually had a nursing instructor uh, at one point in time that said that she was hep, I think hep B or hep C positive. And she, she contracted it during her, uh, you know, nursing um, employment. So when you get hired in, they'll ask you, do you want the Hep B series? I leave that up to you. I'm not going to tell you yay or nay when it comes to vaccines. When, back in the old days, when I was a kid, let's see, I was born 1956, so 5, 1961. I was in kindergarten. I remember marching around the gymnasium and they gave us sugar cubes of the dead polio virus. It was almost, it was, it wasn't, it was the real polio virus. Uh, and and there, were, there were sugar cubes and we just march around and we take the sugar cube and we put it in our mouth. It wasn't recombinant DNA. RNA. It wasn't something that was synthesized in a lab like insulin is now. It was an actual sleeping polio mellitus virus. 
that we took. And I'll never forget that. We didn't ask any questions. They just marched us around the room because my mom and dad had polio. Both my mother and father, they got polio. My dad came over here from Hungary and uh, he was born in 1912, so he was 20. It was 1920. He came over through Ellis Island um, during, when the Austrian-Hungarian Empire was um, in full swing, and he had he contracted polio in Hungary. Um, then uh, my mom was six months old when she got the polio virus. This is before uh, Salk developed the polio vaccine. A lot of children died. They were put on the iron lung because it affect, some of the children it affected their breathing and they couldn't breathe on their own. And now I understand there's a resurgence of polio coming out throughout the world. For the longest time, it was completely almost eradicated. But a lot of people are anti vaccine and we don't have enough people overseas, you know, giving vaccines. So I guess my, my, my suggestion to you is when, before you take any vaccine, research it, okay? Research it uh, and think about it. And is it gonna be useful to you? Is it gonna be beneficial to you? Because hep B vaccine is not gonna prevent you from hep C, right? Is there a hep C vaccine? No. It's just a... Uh, There's not. It's just treating it treating with... Treating it. Uh, what's the interferon? Something like that, yeah. immunoglobulins, yeah. Uh, okay, so what is the purpose of universal precautions to treat all blood and body fluids as potentially hazardous? And number uh, 11, list the steps of medical hand washing. That's what we did here. So today, this weekend, you can kind of practice summing it up. It doesn't have to be a book. Just kind of hit the major points of hand washing. Barrier protection, right, time making sure that you wash your hands thoroughly and dry them. Okay, steps for donning isolation equipment. In a hospital, you may have, from time to time, have to get into an isolation room to draw blood on a patient. Okay? That's part of the game. Now, there's different kinds of isolation. People are in isolation for many different reasons. So if we talk about isolation, well, we talked about shingles. People with shingles are in isolation. People with hepatitis, they're in isolation. C. diff, Clostridium difficile, they're in isolation. People diagnosed with MRSA, they're in isolation. Most of these are contact precautions and or droplet precautions. So when we take a look at isolation, we have contact precautions. Some are all three droplet precautions, and then we have airborne precautions, such as what? Tuberculosis, right? TB is airborne, isn't it? You go into a TB room, one of the things you don't want to do is put a mask on that's a loop mask. Let me get a loop. 